Fine. Good morning. Thanks for joining me here in my uh, shop on another fantastic day. Hey, what am I doing down here when it's so nice outside? Uh, what I am going to be doing is going over the schematic for this uh, Marconi radio in preparation of doing uh, more work on it. Uh, just to recap, the radio is working good generally, but it seems to have no shortwave uh, sensitivity. So it seems, anyway. The AM side seems to be working pretty good. So, let's take a look at the schematic here. Okay, I'm hoping you can see that in the camera clear enough. No, I'm not. Here's a different angle here. So, you can see I've already colored up some of the lines. The red is high voltage, the green is the AVC voltage, and the blue is the oscillator circuitry. But ignore that stuff for now. Now let's just go through the schematic here. As soon as I get a hold of a pointer. <clears throat> so we're going to start kind of on the front end here. Maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll trace the signal uh, path right through the radio first. So, uh, so here we go. Here's the antenna. And you can see there are two sets of coils here. One is going to be for AM, one is going to be for short wave. And the hint on which is which uh, can be found in this switch. So you see this is a rotating switch. There's the, the sliding part and the contacts right there. And that's, that's the band switch, I'm switching from AM to short wave. And there's a note here. Rotary switch in counterclockwise position on short wave band knob and view is shown. Okay, so it's on the shortwave band right now, so we can see from the switch position which coils have been selected here. So if we just track back a bit, you see it's this coil. If the switch were the other way, it would be this coil. So this is the shortwave coil, and this is the AM coil. The AM coil has this added capacitor, and no doubt these coils are different sizes. I think we can take a peek at them right over here. There they are right here. That. This one. And I mean, you can see the antenna wire is connected right to it. So that's the two coils that we're looking at on the schematic here. The other coil beside it was something else. Okay, so throwing this switch switches between these two coils, which makes the antenna resonant roughly in the band that you're interested in. Now, with the AM band and the shortwave band, this is a very broad radio, if you like. It's going all the way from 18 megahertz down to uh, 5.8 megahertz. It's, it's a, got a huge band spread on it. So, now if we just look at the switch for a minute, and we consider this point here and this point here. It doesn't matter which way you throw the switch. This, These two points are always connected to something. So if we track them back, we'll see that this center pole of the switch is tied to one grid here. This is a two grid tube. It's a mixer tube. And the other side is tied to the other grid. So this switch is selecting what is connected to the grids of this tube. We already know one side is selecting uh, one of two antenna coils. The other side is selecting either this or this. Oh, I missed a little bit of blue here. Should be a blue, blue color there. Where are those lines going? Over here to these coils, which are adjustable. There's the arrow going through them. L8 and L... No, I think it's L1 and L2. And if you, if, if you look hard, um, one of them says broadcast oscillator and the other one says short wave oscillator. So this is part of the oscillator, the local oscillator circuit in the radio to produce the um, beat frequency, I guess you could say, that you're going to beat the incoming signals against whatever's coming in from the antenna. It's going to be beat against this oscillator or mixed uh, here in the mixer tube. So that's what's going on with this switch. It's switching these coils and these coils. Very typical. 
Now, just where are, where's the tuning capacitor? So here's one right here, and here's the other one right here. But you can see that this one is attached, if you like, to the antenna coils. It has a trimmer right there. This one is attached to the oscillator coils. No trimmer here. The coils themselves are adjustable to, to trim the frequency of the two oscillators here. Two local oscillators. So that's what's going on in the front end with the switch here. Just connecting the right stuff to the 6SA7 tube. Now if we carry on, the output of this tube, the output of the mixer tube, is out here, comes through this coil, is uh, transformed into the secondary side of the coil, and is fed right to the grid of this next tube, 6SK7 tube. over here a little bit. By the way, you want to get the schematic. I should have said this right away. I got this from a website called radio.codegods.ca. In fact, I wrote, I wrote it down here. Radio.codegods.ca. CA is Canada. And that's where I got this one. It's a, a website I didn't know about until a short while ago, so I don't know if it's new or not, but uh, it seemed to have a, a a good number of uh, Canadian sch uh, schematics on it. Anyway, carry on. So, the job of this tube is to boost the signal uh, from this IF into this IF coil. In fact, basically the gain of the radio is very much dependent on this tube. Uh, this, this is the booster in the radio, if you like. Not quite true, but certainly at the RF level or the IF level, this is it. You want a good 6SK7 in here. You don't get a lot of boost out of the uh, first two. Okay, so the output from here is fed through this transformer. So the output coming here, by the way, is going to be a 456, 462. It's actually 462 kilohertz. So 462 coming all the way through here. Now it reaches this tube. This tube clearly is a triode amplifier here. Less clearly are the two little plates there, and look, they're tied together. So the 6SQ7 can be used in a couple of different ways in a radio, and this one, they've just tied these two little plates together and connected it to this transformer. So out comes the 462, 462.5 kilohertz signal and it's simply rectified through here. And the act of rectification enables the audio signal to be recovered or detected, which is the word we all like to use. And ignore the green stuff, just it just comes down here goes through the volume control, a portion of which is then fed through this capacitor back up into the other side of this dual triple function tube here. So now the audio signal has made it to this grid, so it's amplified in this tube, sent over through here. Oh, there's a very important uh, blocking capacitor there. Fed into the grid here. It's a powerful tube, so uh, because of the heavy flow, at least in my understanding is because of the heavy flow of current through this tube, uh, it needs to be controlled a little better, so it has uh, a suppressor and a screen grid along with the control grid to help it do a heavy-duty job, which is to pump out a, a current into the output transformer and on into the speaker. So that's basically how the signal travels. Uh, first of all, it's radio frequency RF converted to the IF frequency shot through here and all the way to here and out the speaker it comes. Easy. So let's take a look at the power supply now. Okay, so you can see that it's using a 5Y4 uh, rectifier and uh, full wave rectification coming out of here. The rectified um, DC, uh, AC 
which is now pulsing DC, kind of, you can think of it that way, is fed into this filter network here at two big capacitors, C18, C19, let's see, C18, 20 uh, microfarads and 10 microfarads in here, and great big uh, coil here in the uh, filter system uh, doubling as the electromagnet on the speaker. That's called, it's called a field coil. So uh, these are very good filters. When they in introduce the uh, in, uh, inductor here, you get really good filtering action. So wouldn't expect to find a hum. And out of here, this position, this position, come um, a supply of DC current. Now, the heavy current is here, going up here. The whole idea of the radio is to put as much current into the speaker as possible while using as little as possible in the rest of the radio uh, to make the radio as efficient as it could be, as it can be. So that's what these red lines are. So we'll follow the high voltage now. So we'll start here. This is the higher filtered high voltage, if you like. I shouldn't say higher. The more filtered uh, high voltage. It's brought up here. It's fed to the screen. And it's going through this uh, transformer up to the plate. So that's how the plate gets its high voltage. The plate and the screen are the two high voltage terminals, if you like, or high voltage points on the tube like this. So we follow along back. Same sort of deal happening here to the plate. Follow it back further. Up to the plate. A little further yet. And through the coil and up to the plate. So that's plate voltages are coming here. Coming from here. Now here, let me take off another supply. This is slightly lower in voltage. Ooh. Yeah, okay. So it has to be, <laughs> you want the screens to be slightly lower in voltage than the plate. You don't want it the other way around. And here's some resistors here that are affecting that. What's going on here? Two in parallel? Hmm, that's kind of odd. I wonder why they would do that. R8 and R9. What's special about R8 and R9? R8. 30,000 ohms and R9. 60,000. Oh, a 2 watt and a 1 watt resistor. So perhaps they've done it this way because of the uh, amount of current flow. There's current flowing in the screen circuits. Um, it's fairly high and it's pretty high pressure on here, high voltage. So you can develop a fair bit of heat in these uh, resistors. So that's probably what it is. It's probably just a technique to allow some smaller wattage resistors to be used here. That's my guess, anyway. So getting back to following the high voltage, over it comes to two screens. This tube has two screens in it. You can see the connection right in there. And look, here's another fairly large capacitor here, C4. C4 is a 20 uh, microfarad. It says dry electric. It's a very interesting uh, list of parts here. You know, when you look at these schematics, sometimes they they have information on them which uh, isn't all that common but is really really handy so this one they actually name the style of capacitor they put it right in here gang capacitor uh, rolled paper type what we commonly call uh, paper wax capacitors they call it a rolled paper type here's a molded mica rolled paper type molded mica and uh, rolled paper molded mica doesn't say any molded rolled paper. I wanted to see one of those, but I guess it doesn't have any in there. So that's the high voltage. Now we'll take a look at the AVC, another very important element in the tube. The AVC is actually an, kind of an accidental DC voltage that shows up here in the detector because it's a rectifier and it's just like any rectifier, it's converting AC to DC. A DC voltage builds up. Builds up against this fairly small capacitor here. And 
across this is something to pay pay some attention to across the volume control uh, typically AVC voltages are from you know 0 to 15 volts somewhere minus I should say two actually negative voltages um, look it's right in the volume control and the only reason you don't get a DC flow of current through here is because of this capacitor so if this capacitor leaks a bit you have a bit of DC flowing through here not only is it going to upset things on the grid of this tube but when you move the volume control you're going to hear you're going to hear a hissy sort of sound you can't clean it away because of that DC flowing through there so you really want to make sure this is a good capacitor here so down it comes through this uh, resistor R3 how big is that? R3, I bet you it's a big one R3 two and a half mega ohms there's a great big resistor here on this side of the resistor there's almost no current flowing or, or, or essentially no current flowing because on this side as you'll see all it's connected to are grids and you can see one right here this is the magic eye tube you see the magic eye tube is controlled by the AVC voltage which makes this tube very useful in aligning the radio if you don't have a uh, scope or a something of that sort, uh, look, this tube is perfect for you. It's not calibrated, but then you're just peaking things. So if you have a magic eye tube in the radio, you, uh, you're lucking out in that respect. So off it goes, ABC voltage, and it's fed to the grid of the IF tube, and also, fall all the way back, all the way back, it works its way through the switch here, and eventually shows up on the signal grid, if I can call it that, or the second grid of the uh, mixer tube. So the AVC voltage, the stronger the signal, the more negative this line goes, the more negative this line, the more negative the grids, the more negative the grids, the less gain or strength in these tubes. So strong signal quiets the front end, weak signal or no signal at all and the front end is wide open and powerful and that's why when you tune an uh, ordinary AM radio and modern ones are the same thing between stations you hear all this hiss and crackle but when you get to the station it seems as if the station signal is replacing the hiss and crackle but really what's happening is the strong station signals generating a voltage down here and the strength of the radios uh, amplification through here is knocked back and that's why the hiss and the crackle and all the noise disappears and the radio goes quiet so if you don't hear that effect when you tune a radio if it's quiet all the time and then you hear the stations as you tune across them but in between it's very very quiet it could be the ADC is not is not working right and it's holding down these tubes all the time and I guess the opposite would be true too you, you could have no AVC voltage on these tubes and they're running wide open so when you tune something in it's, it's, it's blasting you have to turn the volume down on the radio of course, on short wave uh, this uh, AVC becomes really important because short wave signals fade in and out and as they fade in and out the AVC compensates by automatically turning the volume up and down on the radio basically that's what it's doing so I, now, which which capacitors here are the ones that could uh, that are important? Well, there's various ways of of uh, of looking at that. First one is all these grids here, especially this one, this grid in the output tube. This has to run a little bit negative, or at the very least, zero volts. Normally, it's a little bit negative to the uh, uh, to the cathode. So. If anything makes this grid go a little bit positive, you're in big trouble. And look what's right on the other side of this capacitor is the red line, the B plus voltage. What's that's going to be? Uh, it's going to be 250 volts maybe sitting here. So if any of the charge can leak through this capacitor, it's going to build up on the grid. The purpose of this resistor is to bleed any charge off. It's another high value resistance because you don't want to short the grid to ground so R what, that's R6 let's see R6 half a million ohms half a million ohms in here so that's enough to leak off any DC voltage and keep the grid where it should be while not leaking off 
the signal that's reaching this grid, this capacitor needs to be either proven to be good or just replaced. Uh, another thing that can be done, you can just take your voltmeter and take a reading off this grid, which we'll be doing eventually, and see where it's where it's at. Look up 6K6 in a tube book, see what the grid should be. Is it there? Is it not there? Uh, maybe it's supposed to be minus 6, maybe you find it at minus 2. That might be enough to tell you there's a leak here. And, and what happens if, you, if this, if this uh, grid is not biased properly, you get more and more current just shooting through the tube here. There's no signal involved, so it just shoots through the transformer and just loads the power supply and, uh, and potentially heats this transformer. Heats this tube, heats this tube, heats this coil. Yeah, everything's getting stressed out because this guy here can be bad. So that, that's probably, in my mind, the number one bad actor. You got you got to get this guy out here, and you may you may find more similar capacitors as you work your way back. Now, so there's no there's no uh, high voltage here to worry about, and on these grids there's no high voltage to worry about. So on this radio, because there isn't multiple stages of audio amplification and the like, this one here C15. What what is it anyway? It's probably not that big. C15.02. Your basic capacitor there. Get him before he gets you. The thing too is that if this is leaking and the increased current flow here and here and here and here and here, you don't know about it. The radio will work fine. You won't know about it until you're busy replacing the output tube or who knows what else might be might be happening. Maybe if you crank the radio up to a very high volume, you may start hearing some distortion because the signal is driving the, the grid right out of negative and right into positive. But generally speaking, this is a quiet, silent killer. Now, next capacitor to be a little bit concerned about, and I'm not really doing these in order of importance, um, I don't really have a complete, full opinion of that, is this, this capacitor here. This is a fairly large capacitor bypassing this resistor. So it just goes right over top of that resistor. Now this resistor, based on the current flowing in the tube, pushes the cathode up, so it's a little bit positive above ground. And that's what gives the, quote, negative grid voltage, negative grid relative to this. Instead of the grid being pushed negative, the cathode's been brought up a little bit positive here. The problem with the having this, and then that's a really cool trick for biasing a tube. The problem is, the signal is also flowing right through that resistor. And, and, you know, if you let the signal go through the resistor, then you're going to lose some of the signal, plus you're peeling the, uh, um, how can I put this? You, this transformer is feeling the effect of the tube here. Uh, if this is a really bad explanation. If there's signal here, it's wasted. So what you do is you put a big capacitor here. Bigger the better. And they'll put it as big a one as they wanted to pay for in the uh, design of the radio here. And that essentially shorts the cathode right to ground. There's no resistor anymore. And now the transformer is feeling only and again, I'm not explaining this well. Uh, the transformer is getting all it could out of this tube. <laughs> I'll have to put it that way. So this guy again, if this guy is not good, if his capacitance has fallen off and it's not what it once was, then some of that AC signal will end up in the resistor here. And what it does is it, it just lessens the output strength of this whole design. So we don't want that. We don't want that to happen. Okay, so another capacitor here is this one, C25. Uh, C25 is the tone capacitor, and this they, it's done in various ways. It can be done. The tone can be controlled further up in the circuitry, but in this radio, and this is quite common, it's done here, right on the output. So what happens? It now there's no there's no volume control here, or uh, there's just a switch. Tone switch. Really? Just a switch? 
where's the switch? No, I don't see any switch on the radio here. Got these three knobs. Volume, band, tuning. There was a switch on the back of this radio there. Wow B. I thought that was the uh, phono switch, the, this one here. I thought it was the phono switch. There's the phono jack. But you know what? It might just be a tone switch. Funny that, that it would make sense to them to put a switch on the back where you're not going to get at it. You'd switch it once and never switch it again because you're the kind of guy who likes his tone muted or something. I don't know. That's kind of strange in my mind. You would think they would want this to be a adjustable control on the front of the radio. But not the case here. So, and all this will do uh, is knock off some of the high frequencies. So this is a muffler. You close the switch, the output is muffled a little bit. Now, what other capacitors here might be really critical? Um, let's just see. I'm going to move my camera a little bit. Uh, this guy here. Now, let's see. C9, and you see it's on the ABC system. C9. C9 is 0.05. It's not very big. The only other capacitor on this line is over here. That's this little guy here. He's a little one. Compared to this one, it's nothing. So what this capacitor is doing is it's slowing down the uh, change in the ABC voltage. So if you if you if if for some reason the signal coming in the radio jumps up like a crack of lightning <laughs> comes through it it will cause a jump in the AVC voltage. And so this kind of dampens that effect. It also, if the signal is fading in and out, this will slow down the change in the AVC. Uh, it's more pleasant to listen to, um, I, I guess. In some very expensive radios than that, this is a variable for a, you know, you have a switch, you can select different capacitors and stuff like that. So if this guy's not got the capacitance you're supposed to have, then the AVC voltage is not going to track properly. Um, again, if any one of these are leaky, it's not good. I mean, I don't, there's not too many places you can have a leaky capacitor and have it be okay. Um, so if you look now on the high voltage line again, just look for any capacitor to ground. So we see that one, we see this one. in the filter, but here's one up here, capacitor to ground. These are usually capacitors that are trying to get rid of uh, something, get rid of RF. Shouldn't be there anymore. This is the audio part of the radio. There shouldn't be any RF, but maybe it's made it through here somehow. This is to knock down any RF. Uh, why waste uh, uh, the power of this output to by feeding it some RF, that kind of stuff. So. Um, these things can also, if they're not working right, you can get oscillations. You essentially are feeding a signal through the whole radio on these high voltage wires. So for instance, the RF from here, if it's allowed to, could make it, you know, all the way back in here. And look, basically you got some kind of oscillator going here. And there's lots of possibilities for that. So a lot of these capacitors are just to knock out that possibility. These are usually pretty small. C13, 250 picofarad molded mica capacitor. So chances are he's, he's, he's okay. He's the right kind of capacitor to still be alive at this point in time. C11. C11 is a 0.1 uh, rolled paper type. So this guy's a bit of a danger, if you like. Um, so those are ones worth changing. Uh, the the paper ones anyway. So I think that's about it for the tour through the schematic here. Um, I mean, there's more to it than this. Uh, but I, I like these simple radios because you can pretty much analyze them. At least I can anyway. Analyze them uh, to pieces 
in more complicated radios uh, where there's various kinds of networks of resistors and capacitors and other things where they're trying to, for instance, fancy up how this guy operates by putting in a couple of capacitors and some resistors and they're trying to cause it to behave in a certain way that will help uh, help the radio perform better or more attractively, if you like. This is a nice schematic, by the way. They piece together a whole bunch of stuff from various pages and stuck it on here. We should just take a peek at this. Volume control. What's that? And volume control and, oh, on-off switch. All right. Wave change switch. Funny, eh? you don't expect anybody to say that. It's a frequency change or band change, but here's the magic eye shown here. Electron ray tuning indicator. Why? Doesn't that uh, sell a radio? What? It has an electron ray tuning indicator in it. Uh, it looks like station selector, which is the tuning control. Here's the two coils. Uh, this one is the I'd say short wave RF coil is what it says there. And uh, here's the two IF transformers. Here's the oscillator trimmers are here that we saw up, up here in that circuit. Here. They're located right here. And, uh, oh yeah, look, tone switch right there. Phono jack that answers that, and of course down here is the instructions for how to do the alignment, which we will eventually get to. So, very very nice information on this radio. Really, really very very good. There's a wire legend. What's that? A is a number twenty bare tin solid copper wire. B is a number twenty VHR sixty four. Don't know what that is. VHR64 flex wire. All others are number 20. VHR64. I don't. I don't know what VHR is. But I don't think it's going to stop me. There's a few vari variations. There's a 201 and a 201A radio. On-off switch. Part number for the volume control there. So I'm sure you know part of this business was producing the radios and then producing the parts for the repair of the radios uh, down the road, just like automobiles. So there we are. I think that's that's the tour through the radio schematic. So hope you enjoyed that. And uh, hey, it's just about time to start doing some actual work on this thing. <laughs>